Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you uh, with a bookshelf video. So as you may can see by the weirdness going on behind me, we are painting this room and essentially the last step is for me to do my job, which is to clear off this bookshelf. Oh my gosh, look at the paint in my hair. This is the bookshelf that scares me. Those of you who have been around for a long time will know. I have spoken about this shelf before in my bookshelf overhaul series. This is stacked two and three stacks deep. And there are one, two, three, four shelves on it. So there's gonna be stuff on here that I'm pretty sure I have completely forgotten about. And in fact, we may not get through all of this today, but the goal is to go through, sort things, unhaul the stuff that I don't want, and then this shelf is just going to move out of this room and I am going to get a few new shelves and put them in my bedroom. And so I'm going to finally feel like an official booktuber. So I am essentially making the hard decisions right now. I don't think this is going to be that hard. I've said for years there is stuff on this shelf that I just don't have a need for anymore. One thing that is really going to go for me is a mass market paperback. Even if it is a book that is a favorite of mine, I don't like them. I don't care for them as a format. At this point, I can probably find a trade paperback somewhere. So they're gonna go. Uh, and I think in general, stuff that I used to have, this top shelf is really gonna be where we see this mostly, is stuff that I have kept for reference. And so these are things that I had when I was in university. And I have always kept them thinking, what if I need to come back to this? The truth is I have never come back to them since I was in university. And many of them I had in my first semester, freshman year. I mean, I think that was what, 10 years ago? And I have never come back to them. So I don't need them anymore. If I was somebody who annotated, I think I would keep them. But I really wasn't, especially in university, I just was not an annotator. So a lot of these are gonna be used textbooks that has somebody else's notes in them. So I think I'm gonna let those go too. So I think in the interest of time, we're gonna have to go on and get started. So let's start with this. I have on my Lost Boy shirt. This is my painting shirt. It says on the back, sleep all day, party all night. That's my motto. We have Hesiod's Theogony. I knew the Theogony would be up here. If I ever reread this, it would be in an updated translation. I mean, this is from the 70s. I don't think so. We have the Homeric Hymns, which I believe was probably translated by one of my professors. But you know what? Again, this is an older translation. I'm gonna let it go. This is a collection of Euripides, Medea, Hippolytus, Heracles, and Bacchae. Getting rid of it. This is again, an older translation. I just think if I cared anything about rereading these, I would probably go with a newer translation. At the same time, if it is a play, I have found over the past couple of years that I just don't enjoy reading them. So I'm gonna get rid of stuff uh, that is a play as well. So these are all gonna go. We have Prometheus Bound. I have like three or four copies of this, so I don't need this one. Okay, next we have my edition of Virgil's Aeneid that is in Latin, and this very well may have my annotations in it, so I'm going to keep this because it is in the Latin. There are no annotations in here, who was I? But I think I would like to keep this just for old time's sake. This was how I originally read the Aeneid, so I have kind of a soft spot for it. I am going to keep this one. We have Seamus Haney's Beowulf. I'm gonna keep this because I think I bought this on a rainy day. I've kept it on my reference shelf for some odd reason, but I think I've gotten it more recently. This is something I never read in school. We read like that retelling Grendel. Why on earth did we read that when we could have read Beowulf? Anyways, we have readings in medieval history. This is just in general a textbook, but if you wanna know, I do think it has some interesting things in it. I think it has just a collection of really interesting stuff from uh, the medieval period, but none of them are complete. So maybe the question is, should I just indulge and get something that is complete? I think that might be what I do because this is very unwieldy. Now, this is my Norton English literature. This is definitely a textbook. We've all had to read this, have we not? So this probably does have my annotations in it, but this was a used textbook at the time. I've always thought this would be something worth keeping around. And in fact, I think I'm still going to keep this one. American literature, 
No. The Ancient World, a literal textbook? No. My Secret Book by Petrarch. I have questions about this translation because I have to wonder what on earth this is. Apparently I got this used somewhere. Maybe I'll keep it. A very short introduction to the Russian Revolution. You know, you never know when you're gonna need something like this. And so I do think I'll keep this around. Okay. We then have The Gilded Wolves and the Silvered Serpents by Roshini Chokshi. I am missing the third in this trilogy. In fact, I don't even think I have finished this trilogy. I'm going to keep these because I really, really like her. And so, oh, look at this. I apparently DNF'd that. So maybe I haven't even read the second one in this trilogy. So that is something that I uh, need to correct. And so I'm definitely keeping these. She's one of my favorite working authors. Rebel Spy, I'm getting rid of. This is YA historical fiction about a member of the cult perspiring in the American Revolution. This was fine, as I recall it. It was interesting, but it's not a book I see myself rereading, so I think I'm going to get rid of it. Splinters of Scarlet is a YA fantasy. It's a historical fantasy, and it takes place in Copenhagen. And I think that's the entire reason that I bought this, but this was a fairly massive disappointment to me. So I think I'm going to get rid of it. The Girl the Sea Gave Back by Adrian Young, I'm going to get rid of. This was a Viking duology that I actually really enjoyed. And really, in the end, the reason I was trying to keep this was because of how absolutely gorgeous the naked hardcover was. But I just found this fairly forgettable. It's really not something I foresee myself rereading, but I was always keeping this around because I wanted to do a vlog where I read some Viking fantasy, but I read this off camera. So I think I'm just gonna let this go. Now we're into my Juliet Marillier section and I am letting all of these go because I love her and I want some matching editions. So this is The Blade of Fortrue. This is one of my favorite series of hers. This is the second book. In fact, I don't even think I have the first. And this is the third book, The Well of Shades, which is a library copy. So I would just really rather, if I'm gonna have her, I would like it to be in matching editions and I don't want it to be in a mass market paperback. So all of these are going to. We have back here, I think you can see, these are all mostly textbooks. And so they're gonna go. Uh, we have North Carolina through four centuries. I have never revisited this. I'm sure it's very interesting. It seems like I really enjoyed it at the time, but I'm getting rid of it. God's Almost Chosen Peoples, A Religious History of the American Civil War. Very interesting. Very interesting to study the Civil War through the lens of religion. The Last American Vampire by Seth Graham Smith. Don't laugh, but Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter is one of my favorite books of all time. And this was the sequel. It also was a five-star read, so I'm keeping this. Gulag Voices. Russia in the 20th century. I took a course that was entirely about Russia in the 20th century. And the thing is, these textbooks are not that readable. It's not something I would recommend you start with. It's really just not in general something I would recommend, period. So I'm going to be getting rid of these. The structure of Soviet history, getting rid of it as well. I, nine times out of ten, rented my textbooks but I think this was a course where they made us buy everything. Isn't that ridiculous? Uh, we have a teacher's guide for Caesar, his Latin, getting rid of it. Uh, we have the Buccaneers of America. I'm also getting rid of this. This was my Latin textbook, my first Latin textbook in college. And I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna keep this because it is kind of a beginner's guide to Latin. But I don't think it needs to be on a bookshelf. This really, in general, I think should be kind of in a keepsakes area. Latin prose for the beginner, War with Hannibal. This is something that I think we bought and then we never even got to in the Latin class. Can you believe that? So I don't even know that this is something that I have even gone through yet. You know what? I'm going to keep this because I actually think this is really, really valuable. So I'm going to keep this one. Lost Revolutions, the South in the 1950s. Really interesting. I took a course uh, on women in the South in the 20th century. It was very interesting. And so that's what this book is also from, Cooking in Other Women's Kitchens. This is really incredible and uh, it's very, very interesting. Really discusses recipes, particularly here in the South and 
uh, their history, who came up with them, who cooks them now, and how they have evolved. Really interesting, but I am still going to get rid of it because it was quite academic. So I'm just getting rid of all the old textbooks, I think. Let's move forward here. We have 1776 by David McCullough. This is kind of a classic of American Revolution nonfiction. I think I'll keep it around. We then have Bernard Cornwell's King Arthur trilogy. It's not my favorite of his, I'll be honest. And so I think I'm gonna get rid of these. I also was not a big fan of these editions because the text was so weird in them. Hate to be like this, but I'm giving away, again, all of these mass market paperbacks. I have Interview with the Vampire, Gone with the Wind, and I'm giving away all of my Game of Thrones. I have been intending to reread Game of Thrones for a really long time, but the reason that I haven't done it is that I knew I had them in these editions. So I think it's probably for the best that I indulge and get some really pretty trade paperbacks or the hardcovers, actually. I am torn on keeping A Dance with Dragons because it is a hardback, but I got it used. And the spine was cracked in a really horrible way. So uh, I think maybe I'll get rid of this just in the interest of when I do get the entire series that I get them all and they all look the same. So I'm going to get rid of this one. But last but not least on this shelf is Iron Gold by Pierce Brown, which was a massive disappointment to me. But I'm going to keep it because I do think once the last one in this series comes out, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to commit to it. Uh, so I'm going to keep this one. Let's move on to shelf two. This might be all I can do today because I tell you what, I'm really tired. So let's go on and get into this. This is what's scary, isn't it? Why do I have all these things stacked here? Y'all can't see these bottom two shelves. They're scarier, believe it or not, they are. The Inheritance Games is an interesting one because I read it, I felt like I was disappointed, but it seems like I have heard nothing but good things about how the trilogy ended. So part of me wants to keep this just thinking that maybe I will come back to it and that I would really enjoy the trilogy as a whole. I'm gonna keep it. The Odd Women, I hate this copy, I hate this edition. And so I've never read it, so I'm gonna get rid of this. Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann, I'm keeping. This was one of my favorite books last year and I did not finish tabbing it, so I would kind of like to do that. So I'm gonna keep that. We have Crime and Punishment. I have a whole collection of Dostoyevsky in these editions, so I'm not really sure how this wound up in here. But uh, I'm gonna keep this definitely. I also stopped tabbing about halfway through this. I wonder what was getting into me. We have Flamefall by Rosaria Munda, one of my favorite series. One thing that's unfortunate about this is that I know I have mismatching covers. So that's something I'm going to consider, I think, is maybe when the last book comes out in paperback, that I just get them all in paperback because they went through a cover change, the size of the books changed. I am now thinking because I'm going to have what I think is probably some really pretty bookshelves. I want them to look pretty aesthetic, and so I feel like I'm becoming one of those people who wants everything to line up and match. But for the time being, I am going to keep this. We have The Santa Claus Murder by Mavis Doriel Hay. This was one of my favorite books last year. It took me completely by surprise, but I have several in this kind of vintage crime classic edition. I think I would really like to get them all and put them all together. So I'm definitely gonna keep that. Uh, we have two more right here. We have Midnight in Everwood, which is a Nutcracker retelling. This was massively disappointing to me, but you know, I think I'm going to keep it because you never know. At Christmas, sometimes I'm just in the spirit, so maybe I would like it more on reread. I'm going to keep it, but here we go. The Christmas Egg, which I don't believe I read, and A Portrait of a Murderer, which I loved. I loved this. This was so interesting and so different for a uh, piece of crime fiction, especially from the kind of classic age of crime fiction. So I'm going to keep all of these together. They were all Christmas mysteries. We have These Hollow Vows and the sequel, These Twisted Bonds. I love these. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Fae Romance. I really, really enjoy these. I'm keeping them. We have The Final Girls Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I am, of course, keeping this because I love my man, Grady. Um, here are two more in the Crime Classics collection. Why are they different sizes? <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, but this is Murder Underground by Mavis Doriel Hay. And then we have Castle Skull, which sounds super intriguing. And I might pick this up soon. I haven't read either one of these, but I'm going to put them with the others. We have Prairie Fires, which is a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder. 
This is fantastic. I mean, absolutely fantastic. So I am going to be keeping this one. The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter, I'm going to get rid of. I really enjoyed this first book, but the rest of the trilogy just went off the rails for me. I could not get into it, and I really couldn't believe the turns that it took. So I'm going to get rid of this. The Memoirs of Hadrian, I am going to get rid of this edition because it was annotated by someone else and it was clearly someone who was reading this hoping to like learn about the history of Hadrian. And I think they went into this with the wrong expectations. So their annotations were really quite funny to me, but I really loved this. This is an all-time favorite for me. I think I'll indulge and get maybe the vintage classic edition. Dreamer's Pool by Juliette Marillier. Again, in the interest of getting everything by her in matching editions, I'm going to get rid of this as this is the only one from this series that I own. And I think they're now all in paperback and the hardback is just not out there or it would be really hard to find, really expensive for the other two. But this also is just in general, not my favorite series of hers by any stretch of the imagination. So I think I'm going to let this one go. I've tried to kind of move you so that you can see all of this a little bit more clearly. We are now in my Wars of the Roses section, and I'm going to be really brutal here. I have kept a lot of these just to have, just in general to have a shelf that I think I could truly designate as a Wars of the Roses shelf. Y'all, I don't need to keep this because the majority of these right here are not favorites of mine. And so if it's something that I don't foresee myself rereading, I'm getting rid of it. For example, I hate these Connie Golden books that were about the Wars of the Roses. Not my favorite series about the Wars of the Roses by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I really thoroughly disliked them. So you know what that means. All four of these are going to new homes. We then have the third Plantagenet by John Ashdown Hill. John Ashdown Hill has sadly passed away, uh, but he was a really big uh, Wars of the Roses historian, and specifically he's very favorable to the Richard III Society. But this is literally the only nonfiction on George Duke of Clarence, who was Richard III's older brother. It's literally the only nonfiction on him I have ever seen. And it's very hard to track down here in the States. So I'm going to keep this, even though it's a former library copy and that's never been my vibe. I am in fact going to keep this one. We have The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay. This is an iconic uh, Richard III book, but I'm getting rid of it. Anne O'Brien's The Virgin Widow. I'll be honest with you, Anne O'Brien is not my favorite. Uh, I think I can count on one hand the amount of books of hers that I truly enjoyed, but she's very prolific. If you like her, there's a lot to get into, but The Virgin Widow was her first novel and it certainly feels like it. We then have The Queen of Last Hopes by Susan Higginbotham. Susan Higginbotham is a really big name in the Wars of the Roses world. Uh, largely because she's also a historian, but she is a uh, more pro-Lancastrian, let's say, and so this is about Margaret of Anjou. This was okay. Her writing is just not my favorite. I don't find her prose that inviting, so I'm going to get rid of this one. We then have The Innocent and the Exiled, which is literally Edward IV fan fiction with an original character. And so there's a lot of fun to be had here, but this series, to my knowledge, was never completed. And if so, I don't think it's in these editions. So I'm going to get rid of this. I do have ebook copies of these. The Rose of York, Love and War by Sandra Worth. This is an iconic Richard III romance with, <laughs> with Anne Neville. So that's really who he wound up with. That was his wife. Uh, this is book one in a trilogy. I would be interested to get the other two books. I don't know what editions they exist in, so I think I'm kind of scared to get rid of this, actually. I'm going to keep this one around. This is The Pale Rose of England by Sandra Worth, not my favorite of hers, uh, but this is about the woman who got married to a Perkin Warbeck, who pretended to be one of the princes in the tower. Or did he? Was he really one of them? We don't know. Uh, but this is about his wife, and she lived a really interesting life really sad life actually, but this is not my favorite of Sandra Worth's. I've read it. I don't foresee myself rereading it, so I'm going to let this one go. We have A Rose for the Crown by Anne Easter Smith. This is one of my all-time favorites in terms of Wars of the Roses historical fiction, and I'm keeping it. The Seventh Son by Ray Tannehill. This is one that a lot of people love when it comes to Richard III. Not me. It is just not for me, so I'm going to get rid of this. This is about an original character who gets involved with them, and he is basically a squire, so he comes along with them for the battles and everything. Just was not my vibe. We have The Sun and Splendor by Sharon K. Penman. I would love a different edition of this, but this is my all-time favorite Richard III book, so 
we're not getting rid of this one. Next, we're into my Italian Renaissance section. So we have the Borgia Confessions. I loved this. This is an ARC copy, so I can't really give this away anyway, but I loved this and I'm keeping this. This was the first ARC I was ever sent. We have Blood and Beauty by Sarah Denant. Got to be the best Borgia book I have ever read. I'm definitely keeping that. I loved The Birth of Venus by Sarah Denant. That's one of my favorite Renaissance historical fictions. Uh, I just really, really loved it. You can see I tabbed it. I loved this book, so I'm keeping it. In the Company of the Courtesan was not my favorite of hers, so I do think I'm going to let this one leave. We then have Raphael. This was a historical fiction about Raphael. I did not like this book. It's by Stephanie Story. I did not like this. Sorry, it just wasn't for me. I have always struggled with parting with it, though, because look at this stunning uh, cover, which is one of his images, one of his portraits. I love the cover of this. I just can't get rid of it because it's so beautiful. Then we have A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die. I use this almost like a journal when I read a classic that was on this list. I update it. Uh, and so I want to keep this, but I don't know that it necessarily belongs on a bookshelf. Let's get through this last shelf and then I'm calling it quits for today. We can do these next two shelves another time. So we have back here the Percy Jackson series, the first five books. Let's let them go. This was never for me. I think I was way out of the age range by the time that I tried these. And so uh, I just don't think this was really for me. I'm going to let this go. I'm going to let somebody pick these up who will really, really love them and would love to have them in a box set. Sherwood by Megan Spooner. The Robin Hood book. Why are you reading any others? This is the one. Uh, this is about Maid Marian. She actually is Robin. Robin was like killed on crusade. It is so good. It is so, so good. Back here we have A Court of Thorns and Roses, A Court of Mist and Fury, and A Court of Wings and Ruin. Do you think they're leaving? No, they're not. Mm. Winter Song by S.J. Jones is an interesting one. This is kind of a labyrinth retelling. It's like about the goblin market. And it's really good. I really enjoy the world of this. The shame about this book is it was clearly written as an adult book and she was told by the publisher to dull it down to YA. And to me, it definitely would have been better if it had been allowed to be more explicit. Uh, I just really loved the world of this, the dark vibe. I think this would have worked 10 times better as an adult book or especially as maybe a new adult romance, I feel like this would kill right now on Kindle Unlimited. It really would. Uh, but the second book in the series was wild and it really wasn't enjoyable. I met S.J. Jones actually when this book came out. She drew this. She's a really, really talented author. And so I'm definitely keeping this. We have The Lovely War by Julie Berry. This is a perennial favorite of mine. It's a book that I think on quite a lot. So I think I'm going to keep this one. It's really, really interesting if you have never read it. I think basically I'm gonna say that all of these are gonna go. Uh, this is Sacagawea. It's in a mass market paperback. It's a no from me. Uh, we have uh, a biography of Juliet Gordon Lowe who founded the Girl Scouts. I don't think I need to keep that around. Uh, we have Sarah Poole's Poison Trilogy, which is one of my favorite Borgia trilogies of all time. But I have these on ebook too. I think they're on Kindle Unlimited now. And these are not in matching editions and it's always bothered me. We have some Philippa Gregory, who I just don't foresee myself rereading. But then at the bottom, we have American Gods. I'm keeping that. Actually, I've changed my mind. I'm going to keep the Poison Trilogy. American Gods is one of my favorite books of all time. I love it. I'm due for a reread, but I'm definitely going to keep this one. We have The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. This was so good. I'm definitely keeping this. To me, this is the best Frankenstein retelling I've ever read, though if I'm really thinking about it, I don't know that I've actually read that many Frankenstein retellings, but I really enjoyed this. Last but not least on this shelf, and last but not least for today, uh, we have The Queen of the North by Anne O'Brien. This is one of the more interesting ones of Anne O'Brien's. This is about like King Hal and all that, and the usurpation of Henry IV. It's interesting. It was a really interesting time uh, in English history. It really was. And I tabbed this because I learned a lot, but I'm going to get rid of it. The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. I don't know. It's a shame because to me, this is a really beautiful book. 
I mean, truly, it's just stunning. It's designed like a rare book, but I could not stand this. I could never get into it, and I still don't understand why this is one that people really love, and so I'm gonna let this one go as well. We have made some absolutely incredible progress, so I feel very proud. Uh, it's these lower two shelves, though, in general, that I am more scared of, but I feel good because I feel like more has left than is staying. And so I feel good about that. I knew there was stuff on these shelves that I should have gotten rid of years and years ago. And I'm really glad that I did this just to have that off my back. I really feel good that that happened and that I got rid of a lot of stuff. But I would love to know down below if you have been doing uh, any bookshelf reorganizing here in the spring and the summer. If there is anything I said I was gonna unhaul that you think I should keep, let me know. Uh, but that is going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.